I'm going to talk about the first aeroplane flights made in Antarctica. These flights are often overlooked by historians, or when they are included in the history books, the information is either incomplete or sometimes wrong. The first people to fly in Antarctica also left an incredible legacy of film and photographs, most of which have never been seen before. After the publication of the illustrated Sir Hubert Wilkins, I received a number of requests to show the film and give more information. So I thought it would be a good subject for one of these mini documentaries. By the 1920s, no one had flown an aeroplane in Antarctica. The only person to have seen Antarctica from the air was Robert Falcon Scott, who went aloft in a tethered balloon in February 1902. Sir Douglas Mawson purchased a plane to take south in 1911, but it had crashed in Australia. Mawson still took the motor and the fuselage to Antarctica and used it as a kind of air tractor to move supplies across the ice. After World War I, explorers turned their attention to Antarctica again. Aeroplanes had been developed during the war and they were an obvious means of opening up the last unexplored continent on Earth. One of the people who saw the possibilities of aeroplanes for polar exploration was Australian George Hubert Wilkins. Wilkins had already spent three years in the Arctic, served in the war and flown in the 1919 England-Australia air race. Now he wanted to take aeroplanes to Antarctica. In 1921, Sir Ernest Shackleton was planning another trip south. Wilkins asked to go along and take a biplane. Shackleton agreed and the plane was shipped to Cape Town, South Africa, from where it could be collected as the expedition sailed south. Wilkins left London with Shackleton, but on the voyage south, the quest was delayed with mechanical problems and fell behind schedule. The stop at Cape Town had to be cancelled. When the quest finally reached South Georgia, Shackleton died of a heart attack. Wilkins was disappointed, having failed to get a plane to Antarctica. He decided to raise money for his own expedition. Wilkins sought sponsors for the Australasian Polar Pacific Expedition. He also sought a suitable plane. In 1925, Roll Amundsen returned from an attempt to reach the North Pole in an Italian flying boat and was now trying to sell it. Wilkins travelled to Norway where he met Amundsen and inspected the flying boat, but he failed to raise enough money and had to tell Amundsen he could not afford it. While he was still in Norway, Wilkins received an unexpected offer from sponsors in America. A group of Detroit businessmen wanted to fund an expedition to explore the Arctic north of Alaska. Wilkins travelled to America, where he was put in charge of the Detroit Arctic Expedition. In 1926 and 1927, he took planes to Alaska from where he made repeated flights north, exploring the Arctic Ocean. It was during these expeditions that Wilkins met an Alaskan bush pilot, Ben Eilson. Born in North Dakota, Eilson had learned to fly with the US Army Air Service. At the end of the war, Eilson started flying mail in Alaska. Wilkins and Eilson became close friends, flew with each other many times, and learned to trust each other's abilities. In 1928, with Eilson as pilot, Wilkins made his most famous and successful Arctic flight. Using a revolutionary streamlined Lockheed Vega, the pair flew across the top of the world from Barrow, Alaska to Spitsbergen, Norway. The first plane flight across the Arctic Ocean made Wilkins and Eilson international celebrities. Wilkins was knighted, and his new fame meant he could attract more sponsors. His first ambition was still to explore the continent at the bottom of the world. Wilkins announced plans to fly across Antarctica and was immediately sponsored by the Hearst Newspaper Group. 
Just months after he'd flown across the top of the world, Wilkins purchased a second Lockheed Vega and he and Ben Eilson travelled south on a whaling ship to Deception Island on the Antarctic Peninsula. Wilkins' plan was to fly across Antarctica to the Bay of Wales on the Ross Ice Shelf, where American Richard Byrd had recently established a base. To make the 2,200 mile flight, which was the same distance as his flight across the top of the world, Wilkins needed his plane to carry a full load of fuel. And for that, he needed a long runway to get the heavy plane airborne. On a previous trip to Deception Island, Wilkins had seen the harbour was frozen and would make an excellent smooth runway. But in 1928, warmer weather meant the harbour at Deception Island was not frozen. Instead, it was open, teeming with birds. He would need to find another runway. Wilkins and Eilson cleared a short, curved, stony runway along the beach. On November 16, 1928, they made a test flight the first aeroplane flight made in Antarctica. Then, on December 20, 1928, Wilkins and Eilson filled a plane with fuel for a thousand mile flight, enough to take them into unexplored territory. They bounced along their short rocky runway and got the Lockheed Vega into the air. Wilkins and Eilson flew south down the east side of the Antarctic Peninsula. This is the first aerial footage of Antarctica and it has never been shown before. What Wilkins also did, which is still incredible, is that he took a series of aerial photographs. He recorded the exact location where each photograph was taken and the direction in which his camera was pointing. Some of the photographs he later hand coloured. After flying south for almost 600 miles and having used half their fuel, Wilkins and Eilson turned around and flew back to Deception Island. Despite the lack of a suitable runway, Wilkins was still determined to fly across Antarctica. He decided he would try again the following year. He stored both Lockheed Vegas at Deception Island and returned to the United States. In America, Wilkins purchased a small tractor with caterpillar tracks, hoping he could bulldoze a runway in the snow at Deception Island. A year later, he returned to the whaling station. That year, his loyal pilot Ben Eilson decided not to return with him. Eilson planned to open an air service in Alaska. Wilkins returned to Antarctica with a new team and new pilots. Shortly after reaching Deception Island, he learned by radio that Ben Eilson had been killed in a plane crash in Siberia. In Antarctica, Wilkins tried to level a runway, but the warm summer meant the snow was continually melting and exposing sharp volcanic rock. He was still unable to get airborne with a full load of fuel. Wilkins fitted one of his planes with pontoons so it could take off and land on water. Then he loaded the plane on board a ship and made flights exploring areas along the west coast of the peninsula and in the Ballenhausen Sea. But with heavy pontoons, which were not aerodynamic, he was still unable to get airborne with enough fuel to fly across the continent. Wilkins knew that successful long distance flights in Antarctica would need a long, smooth runway. In January 1930, he packed up his equipment and returned to the United States. This time he took his planes with him, selling them to the government of Argentina on the way north. It would be another three years before Wilkins returned to Antarctica with a new plane, a new pilot and a new plan. That time he would head for the large flat Ross Ice Shelf on the other side of the continent. Uh, but that's a story I'll tell in a future episode. Today very little remains to commemorate the first flights made in Antarctica. The Lockheed Vegas which Wilkins sold to the Argentine government were later destroyed in crashes. 
the childhood home of Ben Eilson in Hatton, North Dakota, is now a museum. The Eilson Air Force Base in Alaska is named in his honour. There are, of course, the photographs taken by Wilkins, the film he shot and the legacy of records and information he left. The limited edition collectible book, The Illustrated Sir Hubert Wilkins, has been produced to celebrate the life of this little known explorer. Only 1,000 copies have been produced. They are exclusively available from the publisher, Netfield Publishing. Proceeds from the sale of the book will help continue the research into the life of Sir Hubert Wilkins and to locate and preserve his lost records. So that's the story of the first flights made in Antarctica and don't forget to press the subscribe button which is down there somewhere uh, so that you'll get future stories. And check out the blogs on the website too.